The Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Now, before we get started, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Lucy Jane Miller founded the Sensory Therapies and Research Center in Denver, the premier treatment center for SPD, currently serving as its clinical director. In addition, in 1979, she founded the Sensory Processing Disorder Foundation, currently serving as its research director. In this role, she directs research at the foundation and is widely known for fostering collaborative research projects. She was an associate professor at UC Denver Medical School with a double appointment in pediatrics and rehabilitation medicine for 11 years. For 35 years, Dr. Miller has devoted herself to the study and treatment of sensory processing disorder and is spearheading the effort to get SPD recognized as a diagnostic entity separate from other disorders. A prolific author with more than 50 articles in peer-reviewed journals, her book, Sensational Kids, Hope and Health for Children with Sensory Processing Disorder, has become a definitive source of information on SPD. Dr. Miller's most recent book, No Longer a Secret, Unique Common Sense Strategies for Children with Sensory or Motor Challenges, offers on-the-spot problem-solving tips to use for children with sensory issues. She has developed the STAR treatment model, which has been demonstrated through research to be effective. Dr. Miller also develops norm reference standardized assessments that are in use worldwide, including the Miller Assessment for Preschoolers, the Lighter International Performance Scale, and the new Miller Function and Partic Participation Scale, and her latest and ninth scale, Goal-Oriented Assessment of Life Skills. She learned a family-centered care approach during her three terms, totaling nine years, on the Gover Governor's Interagency Coordinating Council for IDEA in Colorado. In 2005, she received the Martin Luther King Jr. Award from the state of Colorado. As a founder of the first comprehensive sensory processing disorder research program nationwide and author of groundbreaking books, Dr. Lucy Jane Miller's name is synonymous with sensory research, education, and treatment. These webinars are made possible through generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.com. And now I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Lucy Miller. Thank you very much for that nice introduction, and thank you for inviting me to be a speaker. Today I'm going to be speaking on the sensation of autism. As most of you know, children with autism and adults with autism almost always have sensory problems. That's why it is now included in the DSM as part of the criteria for the diagnosis. We had an 18-year struggle to get sensory processing into the DSM. And unfortunately, they decided not to include it as a separate diagnosis, which we think it is, which we know it is from our research. But they have at least included it as part of the definition of autism, so it's a foot in the door for us, so we're glad. Today, we're going to talk about sensory processing in autism. And um, this is partially from a talk I gave at the National uh, Autism Society National Conference this summer. We did hear um, a little information about me. I started this STAR Center about 10 years ago. I was a professor of pediatrics at the University of Colorado. I have several books which you'd be welcome to take a look at. And I have now nine norm reference standardized assessments. Let's talk about some of the similarities and differences between them. Here's a short outline for the presentation. What are the contributions of Dr. Bernard Winland? Some definitions of autism and sensory processing disorder. Sensory classifications, what are the subtypes of sensory processing disorder? What is STAR treatment and what is a STAR treatment model? What are some physiological symptoms of autism? Does occupational therapy really help children with autism? And a few videos of OT using the STAR treatment model. When we play the videos, um, some of you may not have enough bandwidth to see them. Dr. Rimmel was one of the first people who thought about and talked about the many forms of autism. For those of you who work with children or have children with autism, you know there is no, no such thing as autism, as if it's a one thing. There are children, there are subtypes perhaps, 
which he put together based on his checklist. But truly, if you know one child with autism, you know one child with autism. You don't know all about autism. We do know that there's a very important role of arousal, and that comes from the limbic system, and that those with autism often have many very special gifts. They can be very sensitive, very talented, and can hold down amazing jobs when they grow up, depending on their abilities. So we're going to be talking about the role of sensory symptoms in autism. And one of the good things to know is that autism is not curable. If you have autism, you have autism. But sensory symptoms very often can be lessened. And if you can decrease the amount of sensory reactivity in a child with autism or an adult with autism, you often can change their quality of life. Dr. Rinlin laid the groundwork for today's clinical and research work through his careful observations, his clinical acumen, and his research-directed thoughtfulness. So I want to be sure and just draw our attention to his very many contributions. What is sensory processing disorder? There are lots of really complex definitions, but I like to think of it simply as difficulty responding appropriately to sensory input. And the funny thing is, the sensory input comes into your brain but what comes out is not sensory. What comes out is unusual motor, emotional, attentional, or adaptive responses after the sensory stimulation. So in the interpretation of the information in your brain, you come out with an inappropriate response. Sensory processing disorder occurs along the spectrum, just like autism occurs along the spectrum. And it's only considered a disorder when it causes significant difficulties with daily routines and tasks. All of us have some sensory processing sensitivities or lack of sensitivities. It's normal, and there's a bell-shaped curve, so most people are right in the middle of it. And it's only when you get on the very extreme ends of the bell-shaped curve that, that you will have um, a disorder. Most of the time, it's just a sensitivity or something like that. So here's an interesting idea, which has become much more prevalent in recent years, which is that the categorical definition of autism or of sensory processing disorder is not really a helpful way to think about autism or sensory processing disorder. You don't either have it or don't have it. You have it on a dimensional approach. So there's a dimension of sensation that we are all somewhere on. There is a dimension of interrelatedness that we are all somewhere on. There is a dimension of communication that we are all somewhere on. So you don't either have or not have autism. It's not categorical. Sometimes people look at the definition of ADHD, which says if you have six out of nine symptoms, you have a certain type of ADHD. But if you have five out of nine symptoms, you don't. And that doesn't make sense because it depends how severe the symptoms are and how much they get in the way of your life. And that is the same with autism and the same with sensory processing disorder. The National Institutes of Health now are talking about dimensional approaches to all kinds of developmental and neuropsychological functions as a way to think about these things. So here's just a little visual for a dimensional approach, and only two domains I put here. Sensory processing, there's a dimension that goes from low to high. Social relatedness, a dimension that goes from low to high, and everybody in the world is somewhere on this dimension. And if you think about individuals as having 10 dimensions, cognition, communication, 10 different aspects, and every one of us is somewhere on the dimension from high to low. It gives you a much better way to understand children with disabilities than thinking of a word and saying, are they autistic or not? Actually, at the Star Center, that's probably the number one question parents come in. Is my child autistic or not? And the answer to that you know, will depend on a lot of criteria, and of course, we can answer the question. But it's not really that useful. What's useful is, what do we do to help the child function in the most 
high-level manner as possible and help the parents know what to do with their child and enjoy their child? That's really the question, not does he have a label. This is a nosology that we published of sensory processing disorder. There are three major subtypes. The first subtype is sensory modulation disorder. The second subtype is sensory-based motor disorder. And the third type is sensory discrimination disorder. And I could spend hours talking to you about these. You'd probably go fast asleep if I did. I'm not sure if you can see this, this arrow. Um, but I can see it on my screen, so I think you can see it. Yes, we so can. Under the, Dr. Miller. Oh, yeah. thank, you. thank you for telling me that. So under sensory modulation disorder, we have three subtypes. Sensory over-responsive, sensory under-responsive, and sensory craving. I do want to tell you a little bit more about these as we go along, because many people are confused about the difference between SUR and SC. The two types of sensory-based motor disorders, also considered at SPD, are dyspraxia, which is the motor planning disorder, and postural disorders, which are your ability to maintain your core strength. And then sensory discrimination disorders, some people do not classify as SPD, but their discrimination is an interpretation of information. So if you have trouble interpreting visual information, you might be called dyslexic. If you have trouble interpreting auditory information, you might be called CAPD. If you have trouble with tactile information, you might be called, there are a lot of labels for people who have trouble with touch, with taste, smell, with position and movement, or with interoception. And interoception is a new category we've added. Interoception is your ability to feel your organs. So if you have frequent stomach aches, and you know we have lots of kids with gut problems, and those problems come from an interoception difficulty with sensing their organs. What is the important thing about treating sensory processing disorder is that we can impact quality of life. Many people, many OTs have been trained to look at sensory processing as if it's the end. We look at sensory processing as a means to an end. And the end is quality of life, the so what. The so what is that children with sensory processing disorder have problems with social participation. They have problems with self-regulation, including these things that you see here. And they often have very low self-esteem. When we improve these factors, the child will have a joie de vie, joy in life and success. And that is why we do OT. We don't do OT to change a child's sensory functions. So what is the overlap between ASD and SPD? Nobody has said there's 100%, but I think there's 100% overlap between ASD and SPD, with autistic children all having some sorts of sensory issues. However, SPD is much broader than autism. That's why it's confusing. There are children with ADHD in this group, children with traumatic brain injury, children with post-traumatic stress. So not everybody who has SPD has autism, but everybody who has autism usually has, I would like to say always has, a sensory issue of one sort or another. In the literature, you find estimates from 40% to 100% of individuals with ASD of sensory impairments. Impairments in sensory modulation link to regulation disorders, problems with arousal, attention, affect, activity level. And these things, these unusual sensory interests, hyper or hyper reactivity, interfere with social participation and present lifelong issues. If you do not get your regulation under control, you are going to have a very difficult life. The sensory motor challenges are also called praxis problems, interfere with initiating, planning, sequencing, or building action plans. These are kids who look very clumsy or awkward or just can't come up with an idea. You're trying to play with them and you have to provide all the ideas. They do not have the ideas. That is a praxis issue. Postural issues are very common and we now know 
that an early head lag may be predictive of a later autism diagnosis. I'll show you a videotape of that in just a minute. And also difficulties with balance, with an unstable base of control, can have a profound effect on fine motor. Because if you don't have good trunk support, you're not going to be able to go further out distally and use your hands and use your mouth and use the parts that require you to have a good core support. So this is a head lag videotape. Let me turn off the sound here because it might help you see it if you don't have a wide bandwidth. But watch this little baby as he's pulled up from lying down on his back to sitting. Look at his head. See how he has very poor ability to pull his head up with his body? There's some indication in the literature that that problem is associated with autism, and that's in a four-month-old. So, you know, if they're younger than that, you would expect to see a, head, a problem with head lag. But when they get to be four months old, they should be able to be pulled up without a headline. And of course, everyone is following babies younger and younger, trying to find out what predicts autism so they can get rid of intervention. We had a very important study done by Alice Carter and her team at UMass. Um, she had a birth cohort, that means a whole population of children who were born near New Haven, that was Yale, where she was at the time. Um, 1,329 babies were followed, everybody who was born from 1995 to 1997. And the advantage of this is when you have a population, you can do prevalence work. And she found that by age 8, 70 of the 338 children they still have in the study, or 16.5%, had sensory over-responsive scores above the cutoff. In other words, 16.5% had sensory processing disorder. Of those children, 75% did not meet criteria for any other psychological disorder. So this is very strong data. This is one of the pieces of data that we found um, that we thought was going to get us into the DSM because it shows clearly that 75% of the Children don't have autism, don't have ADHD, don't have bipolar, don't have other disorders. Sensory over-responsivity is associated with functional impairment in children. Alice Carter and her team also found that those children who did have those high sensory over-responsivity scores were four times more likely to have low adaptive social behavior, four times more likely to have clinically concerning elevated internalizing scores, things like anxiety, and three times more likely to have clinically concerning externalizing scores, things like aggression. One of the most important pieces of data that Alice Carter found was that families who had children with SOR exhibited more impairments, and you can define that in many ways, I'll come back to that, than families of children with psychiatric diagnoses. And an impairment is something that is self-identified by the family, things like not being able to go out in public, not being able to go to a restaurant with your child, things like that. And I think part of the problem for people who have kids with sensory issues is there's no support group. There's no recognition that it is a real diagnosis, and that makes it very hard for families. There are physiological studies that differentiate ASD and SPD. One of the most important, I think, is the sympathetic nervous system marker, also called electrodermal activity. I'll be showing you more detail on this. But we also look at unisensory function and multisensory integration and white matter in the brain. Now, this is a little technical, but I'm, I'm going to go through it kind of quick. So if you're bored, just skip ahead on your computer. But I, I think it's most parents really like knowing a little bit about the research behind these different uh, disorders. I started my research work in 1995 funded by the Wallace Research Foundation. They wanted to find some reliable information that was reproducible to go into a medical journal that talked about the arousal problems that children have. So we found this type of 
reaction known as electrodermal reactivity. You can see this child is getting electrodes put on her hand. They come into our lab and the lab looks like a spaceship and they are our little tiny astronauts and they go on a pretend space trip so we try to make it as fun as possible. They watch Apollo 13 when they come in and they get hooked up to electrodes at the same time as the astronauts in the movie get hooked up. So we try to make that as fun as possible too. I have a little video. Again, I'm going to turn the sound off so as to make your videos as smooth as possible. You will see in the video eight continuous trials of olfactory, auditory, visual, tactile, and vestibular stimulation during which we record electrodermal activity. Actually, you're going to see one because I did want to take the time to show you eight. They're all the same. Um, electrodermal reactivity evaluates the response to stimuli by measuring electrical changes in the skin. And the reason we chose this was that these parts of your skin are innervated by eccrine sweat glands, which are connected only to the sympathetic nervous system. So let's take a look at this tape for a minute. And this is called the Sensory Challenge Protocol. So they come in, they watch Apollo 13, and if we had the sound on, you would hear the music playing. And they get very involved in the first part of the movie. We collect baseline data, that is where there's no sensory stimuli being administered. And then we collect electrodermal as they get the stimuli. Now here's the visual. It's a strobe light. You can see that flashing on the child's face. The auditory is a siren. Sounds like this. So it's pretty loud. The third stimulus is olfactory, and it's just mint, wintergreen mint. Each stimuli is three seconds long. The tactile is a feather. If you look closely at this child's face, you can see that he's not really happy with it. The last stimulus is movement. The chair is connected to the computer and it tips back 15 degrees and we're measuring the child's reaction through his electrodermal um, system. Recovery is just sitting still with no activity. And that's basically the experiment. This is the data that we get after we do the experiment. And this data here shows you a typical child. Each vertical line stands for a stimulus. So olfactory 1, olfactory 2, olfactory 3, across the board. And here, the wavy line is a child's response. So if you look carefully, you'll see here is a child with stimulus and he responds. His brain says, uh-oh, something new is happening. I better pay attention. He gets the stimulus again and his brain says, uh-oh, I wonder if I should pay attention. It seems weird I'm having this new experience. By the third time, his brain is not responding as much, and pretty soon he habituates because his brain realizes it's not dangerous, it's not scary. A child with sensory processing disorder has this type of response. His, his responses are much bigger amplitude. Sometimes there's two responses instead of one, and there's no habituation. These are profound differences. And when you look at a child who's under-responsive, they have a response that looks like this. And you can easily see that this is an under-responsive child. It looks so different from the child who is typical. This is typical, this is over-responsive, and this is under-responsive. When you put the data together, it looks something like this. And when you see this data, you'll know one stands for the first olfactory, plus the first visual, plus the first auditory, it's all the first responses added together. Two is all the second responses added together. This is a typical child. They start about here. That's a normal response. And then they habituate and they get lower and lower and lower. The child with SPD starts very high and then they habituate, but they don't habituate nearly as much as a child who is typically developing and it's statistically significant. So we decided we wanted to look at autism versus SPD. 
which is typical. And we have this sample that you see displayed up here. And our findings were very interesting because the ASD group, the group of children with autism, divided into two distinct groups. Most of the children who were taking medication had low arousal. So let me show you what it looks like. You can see these 40 children with autism. Here's the high responders, and here's the low responders. Typical response is right in between. Right here is a typical response. So we know, and anybody who works with autistic children or who has an autistic child knows they're not all the same. Some are very high arousal, some are very low arousal. But it's very good to have some data to show this and to make you think about how to handle children based on their arousal symptoms. These are children with autism and sensory processing disorder and typical, the blue ones are typical, on reactivity. So what you saw before was across the board, across the whole sensory challenge. When you're looking just at reactivity, this green bar is significantly higher for children with SPD. So the kids with SPD have more reactivity if there's a specific sensory stimuli. The next thing we did was the studies using multisensory integration. Multisensory integration is when sensory input comes from various unisensory pathways. So maybe it's auditory and tactile, and it converges on a neuron. Now most OTs are not looking at neurons. This is how a neuroscientist would define multisensory integration. This is how an OT would define multisensory integration, and it's no wonder they don't communicate because they're using the same words to describe different things. In our study, we did flicks in the ear, 100 flicks. We did 100 tactile vibrations in the right median nerve, and then we did both kinds of stimulation at the same time. The children were watching a silent cartoon while we did this study. And what we found was that typically developing children have a typical pattern. This is something that's been repeated in literature over and over and over. The hills and valleys you see here are typical. Nothing to worry about. That's what you expect to see. This is the point at which the stimulus is administered. The green line stands for multisensory integration. And you can see if your brain is working correctly, that response is much bigger than these two single unisensory stimuli. Children with SPD look like this. Actually, they're all over the place. And notice these numbers, P100, P200. We're talking about 100 milliseconds after the stimulus. We're talking about automatic reactions that happen in your brain. You don't have control over them. So kids with SPD are pretty much all over the place. As the SOR, the over-responsive sample gets bigger, the patterns become more variable. As the typical sample gets bigger, the patterns smooth out and become very predictable. Dr. Elisa Marco, this is a picture of her, has been doing a lot of studies on brain structure in autism and SPD. She uses an advanced form of neuroimaging called diffusion tensor imaging, or DTI. And she works with Mukherjee, that's her collaborator. So they studied um, these, let's see, 21, 21 boys all together and 24 matched controls. And what they found was that the children with SPD have differences in white matter in the posterior part of the brain, which is the part of the brain that puts together auditory, tactile, and visual information. And we know that children with ASD have differences in white matter in the frontal part of their brain, the prefrontal cortex, and in areas that mediate social emotional functioning in the limbic system. So we know there are differences in the brain structure of kids with SPD and autism, also ADHD, although I'm not showing you that data. So I'm going to switch gears here because I don't want to run out of time. But I know there's a lot of questions about whether or not OT is effective for children with SPD and with autism. We did a randomized control trial in RCT with three groups of children with SPD. Some of the children were experimental and got SI. 
Some of the children were placebo, but it was an active placebo where they got an activity protocol where they could go into a big room and choose an activity to work with. Or there was also a passive placebo, which was a weightless. They had OT twice a week for 10 weeks for 50 minutes. And we had a written manual that described our treatment approach. Um, if you want to know more about this treatment approach, the most recent writing up that I've been able to do is in Sensational Kids, the second edition, chapter four. It explains our whole treatment method. And our treatment method has logistics of treatment, which are different than other places. For example, we do intensive treatment every single day in a row. We do very intensive parent education and coaching. One out of every five sessions is parents only with no children. So our goal is to educate parents to whatever extent possible so that they can go home and work with their child themselves and not just work, play. It's really about play. And the model also talks about principles of treatment, especially regulation and care, which stands for connect with attunement, using relationships and enjoyment, and some sensory integration processes as well. And then the third part of our model has to do with a therapist characteristics. What kind of therapist do you need in order to be able to do this process-oriented model? So instead of activity-oriented, a lot of OTs will come with a list of activities they want you to do. Something on the zip line, something on the ramp, something on the bob, bubble ball. We don't care what the equipment is. What we care about is the process between the child, the mother or father, and the therapist. This is a picture of our treatment model, and I'm only briefly going to mention this to you to show you how arousal regulation is at the basis of our, of our model, followed by relationships and engagement. And only when you have those two things under control do you then go up to the sensory systems. And we eventually end up with the physiological things, gross and fine motor, and so on, all the way up to the top. And at the very top is joie de vivre, or joy in life. So every session of OT circles around. Start with regulation, goes to joie de vivre. Goes to relationships and engagement, goes to joie de vivre. Because joy in life is what the goal, that's our goal. Our goal is quality of life. And if we don't do that in every single session, then we aren't doing the occupational therapy that the child deserves. This is an example of a therapy session. I'm going to turn the sound off again. And what I want you to know about this session, I'll just show you a little bit of it. There are no, holy cow, went away. There are no, there is no sound it's all imitation. So everything that they do, they're doing by watching each other, looking at each other. She's following his lead. And he's having a great time. And if you heard the sound from this, you would go, but there's no sound. And that's because we don't overwhelm the child with language. We, he's trying to find foot. Now watch how cute this is. The foot pops up and he jumps for it. See her little toes there? And he's having a great time, and he's doing everything that he needs to do non-verbally. But his relationship with the therapist is fantastic. And this goes on for a good 20 minutes, where he is telling the therapist what he wants, and watch how he shows her that she wants her to do a hand bump. Another hand bump, and then, oh, rain coming down. And she just follows his lead and does what he wants. That's a little picture of what therapy will look like. The design of our randomized control trial looked like this. T stands for when they were tested. So the first group had the alternative treatment, an activity protocol, where they came into a big room and they were able to do coloring or pick their nine different tables building with blocks, reading, costumes, whatever they wanted. 
they did that for the first session and then they did OT. The second group did OT first and then they did the activity protocol. The third group had a wait list first and then activity and then OT. So everybody got OT in the end. I'm going to show you some data from this time too comparing these three conditions. And here's what we found. The kids in OT on goal attainment scaling just had a tremendous advantage, significantly different than the other two groups. Goal attainment scaling are parent goals, so they did they were highly more, statistically significantly more able to do those. The difference in emotion regulation and cognitive social functioning was also much bigger for the OT group. Differences in the short sensory profile, not always the best measure because sometimes parents think children do worse just because they finally understand what the words mean, that they're filling out the profile. But in this case, they did much better. And most importantly, probably, is electrodermal reactivity. This is how much the children's reactivity went down. Remember how when I showed you that profile, the kids with SPD had that really bumpy, multiple multiple um, reactivity responses. Here we saw how much they decreased during their time in OT. So over that 20 weeks, they decreased 20 sessions, excuse me. They decreased olfactory, auditory, visual, tactile, and movement. All decreased significantly. There have been two randomized control studies of children with autism, one by Beth Pfeiffer. You can look up her reference. And uh, what I love about this piece of research is that half of the group got fine motor technique and half of the group got sensory integration. The group with the fine motor also demonstrated improvements in handwriting, but the group with the SI demonstrated greater improvement in individual goals than the fine motor group. So both types worked. And the reason I think it's such a legitimate study is both they weren't trying to show only SI works. They were trying to show depending on what you do, that is what improves. Another even more recent study by Roseanne Schaff and colleagues did a randomized control, controlled trial and found a huge change in goal attainment scales, parent goals. So I have a few examples of treatment, but um, considering you might be having a little trouble seeing these, I'm going to just kind of skip through these. And I want to talk to you for just for a second about our out. We are trying to move our model outdoors. So turn off the sound. You can see this is our outdoor playground. It's really designed for children with sensory autism and other special developmental issues. We can do therapy outdoors. We do not need to be indoors to do therapy, especially when it comes to regulation and relationships. And it can be much more natural. Parents are much more natural outdoors. Kids are more natural. We do groups outdoors as well. And the playground affords everything really you can find indoors, plus more. This is our merry-go-round, our clubhouse. And the children are involved in planting our sensory garden, which we plant every spring. The parents are involved. Every piece of equipment is multi-sensory. It has more than one sensation included. This, of course, is vestibular. But you can see it also involves whole body movements. The swing has flute included inside the swing mechanism, so it makes sound. And we have everything labeled. We have a really cute fairy garden for our kids and parents. And we could do our parent education outside on the playground. We can do staff meetings outside on the playground. And it just makes a huge difference in our ability to to work with the kids, to be outside the box, we call it. Because inside, you're inside a box. Outside, you're in a natural setting. And it just makes everything better. Uh, 
Um, so this is a videotape showing a child in the group, one child with autism, how he ends up joining the group, and his mother ends up talking about the playground. But everything that was great happened on the playground. We do mentorship one week a month where people come from all over the world and they're in intensive training. If you're interested in that program, please see our website. I'm sure they'll show our website at the end of this, um, which is spdfoundation.net or starcenterus.org. We treat 500 families a year with our intensive model, 40% from outside Colorado and 15% from outside the U.S. And I've talked to you a little bit about our philosophy of burst treatment, intensive treatment, parent-focused education, and focusing on developing a sensory lifestyle, not a sensory diet. We don't give out sensory diets. We teach people to think about what their child needs and to go from there. Um, this first question, this person saying good afternoon from Brooklyn. They're, they're asking, what's the best therapy for a child with SPD who is refusing to eat, brush his teeth, et cetera, due to sensory issues? Well, we have somebody at the Star Cent Center named Kay Toomey. She does SOS Feeding Solutions. It's a very specific program, and there are other feeding programs, but I really like her approach. It's based on sensory regulation first and then feeding, no force feeding. And there are a lot of programs that force feed kids. If the child chews the food and spits it out, the food sits there until the child picks it up and they're not allowed to leave the table until they eat that chewed up food. I don't think that works. And I don't think it's good for the child. So I would look up on the web SOS Feeding Solutions. And if you can go to one of Kay Toomey's workshops, uh, I would really recommend that. We also have some of her workshops online on our education channel. Okay, the next question. This person's asking, how do you test for SOR? So I think you talked about that, but maybe you could just touch on that again briefly. So SOR is sensory over-responsiveness. There are two ways of testing for it. The first way is a parent checklist, where the parent checks from a variety of different things. How does a child respond to tags in the back of his clothes? How does a child respond to mud and having his hands dirty? How does a child respond to other, you know, being having his feet off the ground? So there are a lot of questions, maybe as many as 30 or 40 questions about SOR that the parent fills out on their checklist. The other way is called a performance measure, where we measure the child's responses. So, for example. We have an item on our test where there's a strobe light and the animals are all out in the storm. And the child has to take the animals from the storm and put them into the corral. And what we're looking at is the child's response to the strobe light, not how many animals they get in. That's called a performance measure. So mo the best is a combination, to do a combination of a parent report scale and a performance measure, if you can find a place that does those both. Okay, so the next question. Could you please comment briefly on how ADHD interacts with autism and SPD in terms of the neurology? Do you recommend ADHD be treated with the STAR model as well, or do you think medications to get ADHD under control are a prerequisite for effective treatment of sensory issues in children? So I don't know if you want to talk about medication at all. Yeah. I think they're really talking about that interaction. And medication is never a prerequisite for treatment. We always do OT first, and then our, we have a doctor here on our team, too. And she will pursue, there's nothing wrong with medication. Some people are anti-medication. I think medication can be very helpful, but it's never the first thing you try. You always want to try using the sensory techniques first. See how much of the sensation you can get under control. And from there, whatever's left over might be attention that you would have to deal with. The neurology of ADHD, autism, and SPD are different. There are different parts of the brain. The biggest problem with attention deficit disorder is response inhibition. Response inhibition. It means a child cannot stop something. So if you're having them 
hit a button on the computer every time he sees an X on the screen, he hits the button, and then there's a beep, and he has to not hit. He can't stop himself. He'll still hit the buttons. That's called response inhibition, and we work with that with every child. We have stop and go programs so that they learn. We send them home with a little pretend stop sign that they can use on their parents, or parents can use on them. They need to learn how to inhibit their responses. And I'm not saying it's as simple as using a stop sign. That's just one example. But we treat autism, we treat ADHD, and we treat sensory processing, and they all have different treatments. But it depends on the individual child. So there's no recipe, unfortunately. If there was a recipe, all the kids would be fixed already because we'd all know the recipe. It has to be individualized. It has to be based on a very good multidisciplinary evaluation. Many times children are treated before you really know what's wrong. And we feel very strongly that if you don't know what's wrong, you can't fix it. So we do a multidisciplinary evaluation with psychologists, speech language, OT, and medicine. And then once we know what's wrong with the child, then we can develop a, a program in collaboration with the parents. Okay, great. The next question, they're asking about auditory integration training. This parent is saying that their son had participated it or participated in it, and they're curious as to what the data is on the effectiveness of the therapy. The data that I know about is very limited on all the auditory programs. The, the one that we use is called Integrated Listening Systems, ILS. We just published an article on it showing effectiveness with case studies of um, N of 7. There's a few articles on auditory integration also, but the overwhelming evidence that it works is not there. So there, is, there are some suggestions that it works. There are many articles that show it doesn't work. It kind of depends on the child. What, what I tell parents that come here is, you know, try it. If it works, use it. Not very scientific. But if it doesn't work, don't use it. And it's not magic. There's no magic bullet for our children. We try everything. We try nutrition. We try chiropractic. There's nothing that we're against. We have a very open-ended policy. We don't do just sensory. And I think parents should feel comfortable trying things but be open to looking for change. And what I do with my parents is I give them a little scale when they start something new. And they mark on the scale how their child is on five different things, like attention, um, getting out of the house, or whatever five things are important to them. We make this little scale. It goes from 0 to 100. And every night before they go to sleep, they put an X to show where their child is. Then they start the new treatment, and every night they put an X. And it turns out you can measure that space, and you can tell whether things are working. I think the biggest problem is people don't know how to to study whether or not things help their own children. Sorry, I don't have a slide to show you this because it's such a simple technique. It's called visual log. And the visual log will tell you not no one can remember that what their child was like a week ago. But today, you can remember today. So tonight before you go to sleep, if you marked your X's, it would represent how your child did today. If you saw a big change when you started auditory integration therapy, then you would know it was working. If you didn't see a big change, it wouldn't be working. So I'm getting a, a number of questions about adults, um, about SPD treatment in adulthood. And so can you talk a little bit about the yeah. effectiveness in adulthood and also if it's any different from what you would do with a younger person? It's completely different. We are just starting our adult program. We have, I guess, three or four more months to find out if we can make it work or not. And then if we bring in enough funding to keep it open, we'll be able to keep the adult center open. It's upstairs at the Star Center. It's really beautiful. And we're trying to get five other providers, psychologists, audiologists, if any of you know anybody in Colorado who's looking for space, please have them visit us because we need to rent out those offices. So our adult program is just starting up, but the way it works is really different than children because 
adults know what's wrong. They may not know exactly what sensory system was affected, but they're much better reporters than children are. So we test them on pieces of equipment in our center, our adult center. And everything is, of course, bigger. And the treatment is consultation. So together we work out a program that might include proprioceptive input or vestibular input or auditory input. And we make a plan, and then they go back where they're from. And sometimes we do it online. We have a number of people we try to treat online. but. It really works better if they can come here, we can do the evaluation, set up a program, and then they go home and do the program, and then we can do all the follow-up online. So that's basically what our adult program is. This next person is asking, can you explain the reverse pyramid of treatment with specific examples of how it is done? I think the reverse pyramid they're talking about, Air's pyramid is upside down of our pyramid. I'm not sure this is what they're talking about, but Air's has a pyramid that goes in in this direction, you know, in this direction where the bottom is sensory and it's really big and the top is very small and it's cognitive and the truth of the matter is our brain works the other direction. So our brain has much more information at the top and that's why we reverse the triangle because the top, the cortex is really where so much executive function, memory, attention, emotion, all of that is put together at the top. How does our pyramid work? Is that first of all, underneath the pyramid you see regulation. Then you see relationships and engagement. And we work on that sometimes for months before we will bring in other activities. But by the time the child leaves the star center, we will have gone through every aspect of the pyramid, every block that's in the pyramid. So we start at the bottom with regulation. But we always include joy in life as part of our treatment, and that's at the very, very top. Because if I go to an OT center, if I visit an OT center and I walk in the door and I hear kids screaming, you know, that is not, I know that treatment is not working. I mean, obviously, if a child is screaming, something is wrong. You can't force children. You have to play with them. You have to use play to engage and motivate children. And that's where the art of therapy comes in, is making it look. So parents used to come in and say, it looks like a one-way mirror, and they'd look at them and they'd say, but, but you're just playing. And we'd say, well, it's not just play. It's smart play. Smart is sensory, motor, attuned, relationship-rich time. So we do smart play. We teach our parents how to do smart play. But it has to be through play that the therapy is accomplished. It's a complicated question. I hope I answered it well enough. <laughs>